Good morning. On behalf of the San Diego Union Tribune Festival of Books, I welcome you to this wonderful theater on the USD campus. The, yes. This discussion is the 1619 Project. It's with Nicole Hannah-Jones, who's with us remotely, and our moderator is Lisa Diedrich. Take it away. Uh, one more thing. When it comes to question and answer, we ask that you come up to the microphones. We have too many people in here to pass it around. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Lisa Dederick. I'm a columnist with the San Diego Union Tribune. And today, we are being joined by Nicole Hannah-Jones. Nicole Hannah-Jones. <laughs> She's the Pulitzer Prize winning creator of the 1619 Project, a profound and powerful work she conceived for the New York Times Magazine to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the beginning of slavery in what would become the United States. In centering chattel slavery's history on this land and its modern legacy, the project reframed the way we understand the United States and the contributions of black Americans to this country. She is the winner of numerous awards, including the NAACP Image Awards, National Magazine Awards, awards from the National Association of Black Journalists and from the Society of Professional Journalism. <clears throat> Excuse me. She was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2021. She was a MacArthur Fellow in 2017. She graced the cover of Essence Magazine in 2021. And in 2016, she co-founded the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting to train, mentor, and increase the number of investigative reporters of color. Her lead essay in the 1619 Project was awarded the 2020 Pulitzer Prize. Please join me in welcoming Nicole Hannah-Jones. <laughs> Nicole, thank you so much for joining us to have this conversation about your landmark work. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Sorry that I could not be with you all in person. That's OK. We understand. We're glad that you're here with us virtually. Um, I would like to start at the beginning and how you've talked about the moment that you first learned about the date 1619 in high school from your teacher, Ray Dial, who taught the African American experience, which was an elective you took during your sophomore year. Can you talk about what learning about that date did to your understanding of this country and its history at the time? Sure, absolutely. Um, I talk about that moment of coming across the date 1619 in a book that Mr. Dow gave me called Before the Mayflower um, as being somewhat of a lightning bolt moment for me. I, um, like most American children, uh, most of my education had learned very little about black Americans, um, very little about black contributions. Of course, we knew that we were here because we had been enslaved and that a civil war was fought that maybe was about slavery and maybe was not. Um, and, you know, I have a dream uh, 100 years later, but that was about um, the sum of it. And so I took this one semester black studies course in high school and it just um, blew my mind. I learned more in that one semester about Black Americans and Black people across the globe than I'd learned my entire life. And I became really obsessed with learning that history because of that. Um, and so I would ask Mr. Dow to give me books to read on my own. And one of the books he gave me was Before the Mayflower. And it was about 30 pages in that I realized what the title was talking about. That's when he talks about um, a ship by the name of the White Lion that landed at Point Comfort, Virginia in 1619. And I had never heard that date before. I'd never seen that date before. I'd never heard of the White Lion. And I certainly didn't know that Black Americans' lineage um, in the United States went back to just 12 years after the first English colonists settled Jamestown. So that was a really transformative moment for me. Um, it spoke to both the, the power of um, having a lineage that goes back that far. Of course, we know every American child learns about the Mayflower, and yet none of us had been taught about the White Lion. Um, and so it was both an empowering moment, but also a moment that taught me that the history we were learning was not all that could be known, that it was a curated, 
a manipulated, a managed history, and that people had made the decision to teach us about the Mayflower and not to teach us about the White Lion. And so I think that really began my lifelong quest to better understand this history um, and to bring this history out of the shadows. Because I think um, without learning about things like this, the White Lion in 1619, that that erasure is very powerful. It shapes our understanding of our country, um, but it shapes our understanding of our country in a way that is not honest or truthful. Yeah, absolutely. And I was also curious how that date continued to speak to you over the years until your pitch to the New York Times Magazine to do this project. Yeah, anyone who knows me at all knows that I have talked about the year 1619 since I was 15 years old. Um, I, I think we all understand the power of symbolism. And for me, like I said, that day stood in for um, both a, a legacy and an erasure. And um, so, I have thought about that date and what it meant uh, that we have not learned that date because when I pitched the 1619 project in um, February of 2019, most Americans still did not know that date. It wasn't a familiar date. It wasn't part of the national lexicon. Um, and so, so much of my work, I think, has been trying to work back to that moment. Um, you know, as I've spent decades, uh, the last two decades as a journalist writing about racial inequality, school segregation, housing segregation, policing, um, all of this that we see is a legacy of slavery. And yet we hadn't been taught that date. We haven't, we've been taught to kind of think of slavery as marginal, as an asterisk um, to the American story and not central. So um, I, I have just held on to that date um, you know, through the last three decades when I first came across it. And uh, I used to kind of joke with my, my editors because uh, as I moved from being a newspaper journalist to a magazine journalist, uh, my articles started getting longer and longer because I was going further and further back in time. And I always believed that you cannot explain modern America, particularly when it comes to racial inequality, if we aren't helping um, Americans understand how we got here, that we learn such a paltry history that doesn't explain the society we live in. So I had, I believe I had to build that history into all of my contemporary reporting. And I used to joke that eventually I was gonna get back to 1619. And um, then for the anniversary, clearly that's, that's what I did. And so the work, both the magazine and subsequently in the book, has been the center of both resounding praise and some significantly heated debate. So people are applauding the points made and the facts that have been excavated, while others are angrily banning the work from discussion in their homes and schools. And so as I've you know, noticed this response, one of the first things that came to mind was Beyonce and talking <laughs> about, you know you that when you cause all this conversation, which you definitely did, what has been your reaction to experiencing this kind of response to your work? Oh, God. You know, I, I almost posted that quote <laughs> two days ago, um, which was the third um, anniversary of us publishing the original 1619 project in August of 2019. And I didn't because I've been trying to be much more chill on uh, nah, Twitter. No, don't chill. Turn it up. <laughs> Turn it up. <laughs> and I, I knew what it would invite, right? Because I, I know what a... Um, what a symbol I have become, not just the work. So uh, a symbol for people who love me, a symbol for people who hate me. And so every single thing that I that I write publicly now just gets parsed a million ways and can turn into all kinds of craziness. So I didn't, I didn't post that, but thank you for saying that because well, that, that, that is you. what I was doing I a couple you. days ago. <laughs> um, so how I've handled it, you know, it, it really, um, it has, it has changed. Um, when the project first published, I, had no idea if anyone would care. Um, you know, this was tens of thousands of words on the legacy of slavery. And clearly the reason I created the 1619 Project is we haven't wanted to deal with the legacy of slavery. So I had no idea um, if anyone would respond to, or if, you know, we have such a, a cluttered um, life with 
you know, a million tabs open on our computer. There's so much news and so many stories coming, you know, would it last more than a day or two? Uh, so to see the response, the way that, you know, we sold out of, um, of the original project several times, uh, you know, just the, the way that people, schools embraced it, communities embraced it, I was just absolutely astounding and gratifying to me. And then of course uh, came the inevitable backlash. And I wasn't initially shocked by the backlash. I, cons I, I expected conservative backlash. You don't make the arguments that we make in the project. The project is intended to be evocative. We want, you know, we want you to question settled narratives. It, it, it should have felt deeply unsettling uh, to, you know, people who buy into American exceptionalism and American empire. So I expected that pushback, but of course, um, no one could have predicted what has transpired over the last three years. I, I certainly didn't expect the president of the United States to, uh, to castigate the project publicly again and again. I didn't expect powerful senators to introduce legislation to prohibit the teaching of the project. I didn't expect bans. Um, I, I've heard from a couple of, of historians and they, they say they don't believe that there's ever been a, a single work um, that has been so cited in state bans, um, like in the actual text of the laws and the ban. So I couldn't have predicted um, any of that. And um, there have been a lot of um, highs and lows. So I, I felt really amazing highs that people were talking about this work, that people were making these connections uh, between this legacy of slavery and, and society we were living in. But there were really dark moments, you know, where uh, there were really coordinated efforts, not just to discredit the work, but to discredit me as a journalist. And uh, I'm a human being, right? I, I might be spicy on Twitter, but uh, I'm very sensitive, particularly because I this work meant a lot to me. Um, I know all the tears that were shed collectively in producing this work, and I know how important this work had become uh, to my larger community. So um, it's been it's been an interesting three years, and I, I've I've now come to what I think is largely a place of zen. Um, the beauty of having gone through all the ups and downs of the last three years is that is I'm pretty unfazed by where things are. What as human beings, I think we are um, primed to pay attention to the negative. So we all know this, right? In our personal lives, uh, someone can give us 10 compliments in a row. And the one criti criticism is a thing that we pay attention to, right? Because we somehow think that one criticism is really the most important thing um, and not the 10 compliments. And um, I've had to like remind myself that um, the vast, vast, vast reaction to the project has been people embracing the project, people saying, I, I just never knew any of this. This has helped me understand myself and my country. Um, and, you know, really separating in my mind the valid critique, because, of course, there's valid critique. You, you, you cannot produce public facing history like this. Uh, that's this ambitious. And, you know, we start with this provocative question. What would it mean to to consider our, our founding, our origin, 1619, the beginning of slavery and not 1776? Like, of course, there's going to be debate of that and there should be. Um, and so being able to really separate what was valid critique from what was just attacks, uh, what was, what was uh, bad faith critique. Um, and so now, you know, uh, there's little that can that can phase me when it comes to the project. And I'm mostly just grateful that um, three years out, people are still talking about the work. People are still reading the work um, and good folks like you would, would gather to to hear me talk about this book. So now let's get into more of the book early in okay. the book and talking about the previous story of the country's origin that has been upheld. And then this newer, fuller version in the 1619 project. You say that if we are a truly great nation, the truth cannot destroy us. What do you make of this fear that so many people seem to have of simply engaging with ideas they disagree with and going so far as to implement these kind of policies and punishments for even discussing them? 
Right. So so here's what we know. One, since uh, I'm speaking to people at a book festival, I assume you all, no matter what your politics are, are of like mind that a healthy society doesn't ban books. It doesn't ban ideas um, that a healthy society actually believes that uh, we should debate and we should be exposed to different worldviews and perspectives Um, and a society that bans books. Uh, governments that ban books, that just means they don't believe they can make a better argument. Because if you believed you could go into the marketplace and make a better argument, then you would do so. Um, You wouldn't try to restrict people from learning something that you think is not. Thank you. So when I then um, think about where is this reaction coming from? Well, Again, the the reason the project exists is we have um, generationally, willfully lied to ourselves, right? Our our identity as Americans is that we are an exceptional nation. How many nations say that? Like every every person loves, you know, most people love their country. But this idea that we were exceptional because we were the only nation in the history of the world founded on ideals of individual liberties. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal, right? That we were the greatest, freest society in the history of the world. And yet we were founded as a slave holding republic. That's actually fairly undeniable uh, if you just dispassionately look at history. At the revolution, right, we know one fifth of uh, the population of the 13 colonies was enslaved, that while we like to think about the heart of America, uh, both in the revolution and after as the abolitionist North, all 13 colonies at the revolution uh, had slavery. And the true heart of the revolution was Virginia, which was a slave society, right? Um, Just look at who wrote the declaration. It was an enslaver from Virginia, who was the father of the constitution, an enslaver from Virginia, Bill of Rights, enslaver from Virginia, first president, enslaver from Virginia, right? Like we can just go on and on. Um, So what you realize is our entire identity um, as Americans is predicated on on a fiction, right? On, on, On us all Um, colluding not to acknowledge the truth of who we are. Of course, we can't deny slavery existed, but we can marginalize it to the point of insignificance, right? We can say, oh, that was just some backward Southerners. It didn't really have much to do with who we are as a country. And there's a great deal of investment in that mythology. Um, More than anything else, the 1619 Project is a work of memory, right? It It is a work that's trying to say, we have been remembering wrong. We have been remembering a lie. Um, so we need to remember our country in a different way that is much more accurate and frankly, much more ugly and doesn't always center solely white people as the heroes of the story. Uh, there were plenty of white people who did heroic things. They just don't happen to be the people we often valorize, right? Like William Lloyd Garrison or Charles Sumner are true like anti-racist white men. Um, so I understand because I understand this is a work of memory, because I understand that um, kind of our collective under, our collective identity as a country and our collective narrative of a, of a country is designed to justify power. It is designed to justify hierarchy. It is designed to justify all of the inequalities that we see in our society today. But that is a very dangerous thing um, to people who Uh, willed power, I would say, illegitimately, and also just to regular Americans who have really bought into um, this belief that we are exceptional and exceptionally free. And I think that there is this kind of collective experience of what I had as the Black girl um, in Mr. Dow's class, which is surely, if this were true, someone would have taught this to me before now. Right. So if you've gone your whole life with this belief and then here comes along this project that is sitting to like topple everything you kind of think about your country, even as far as what was the motivation for the Revolutionary War? Was it freedom or slavery? Um, that there is a sense of disbelief because how could how could I not know this? Um, and then there is a sense of loss because your identity is so connected uh, to these lies of our history. So to me, that is why we have seen the type of response. Um, I, I've been reading a lot of um, a lot of historians who study authoritarianism, uh, historians who study kind of the erosion of democracies. 
And what is clear is that um, when you want to maintain illegitimate power, uh, when you want to exert social control, you come after the storytellers. Um, you come after the people who unsettle the legitimacy of your power. And so much of what we're seeing um, from conservatives right now is a desire um, to stoke racial resentment, to stoke uh, resentment against marginalized people in order to pass really regressive anti-democratic policy. And when it comes to America, uh, the oldest wedge issue that we have is race. So when you can um, target a work like the 1619 Project and use that, I mean, it, the 1619 Project was in both of Donald Trump's impeachment trials. That doesn't even make sense, right? Like. <laughs> When, when, when friends texted me and they were like, oh my God, they mentioned 69, Trump's lawyer mentioned 69 in his impeachment trial. I'm like, you're lying. That doesn't make, like, <laughs> why? Um, it gets mentioned in the confirmation hearing for the first black woman Supreme Court justice, right? So it, it has become clear that the 1619 project is used part of this larger message to tell to stoke resentment amongst a, a significant segment of white Americans by saying, they wanna take your history from you. They wanna tell you you're not a great people. They wanna say you're racist. They wanna blame you uh, for everything that was done in the past. They wanna snatch down all the monuments to white men like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and steal your history and instilling your history, they steal your identity and they steal your legitimacy. So this is why I don't know what about you know, the 1619 Project made it the thing. Um, uh, I, 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 can, I can guess at what it was, but that is what we're seeing because we also know the 1619 Project has the biggest target on it, but all of these so-called anti-critical race theory laws, which are really anti-history laws, these book bans, these bans of books that teach about LGBTQ Americans, uh, these anti-trans laws, these anti-voting laws, uh, you know, the overturning of Roe, these are all part of um, an unhealthy society that does not want to deal with itself um, and a minority that wants to hold power at all costs. Mm. In your essay on justice, you talk about how origin stories function to some degree as myths to create a shared sense of history and purpose and that the origin story of the US is a myth that almost exclusively positions white Americans as the architects and champions of democracy. So yes. in that essay you say, but as this book has shown, a truer origin story requires us to place black Americans prominently in the role of democracy's defenders and protectors because the efforts of black Americans to seek freedom through resistance and rebellion against violations of their rights have always been one of this nation's defining traditions. When we collectively understand black Americans in this way and having this kind of role in the narrative we tell about this country, what does that do? What do you think it changes? Well, I, I think it, it changes a lot. Um, and, and that's part of what the backlash against the project is, right? So if we look at uh, the fact that uh, we were founded as a slaveholding republic. We were not founded as a democracy or a representative democracy or a democratic republic, right? We were founded uh, by elite white men who only believed that property white men should vote. So women couldn't vote. Uh, black people were enslaved. They couldn't vote. Indigenous people were not considered citizens. They couldn't vote. Um, and then we look at the words that they wrote, uh, and then we look at, well, who actually believed in those words? Who actually fought against their own country to make those words manifest, not just for themselves, but for all people? And that clearly is Black Americans. Uh, we see this you know, at the Revolutionary War period when Thomas Jefferson, uh, whose occupation was he was an enslaver, um, goes to Philadelphia with one of the people he owns to keep him comfortable and writes those words of the declaration, that that was a succession document, right? The declaration uh, was a document where the colonists laid out all the crimes they believed the British had committed against them and said, this is why we deserve to break off from you. But a black man looked at that opening stanza, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And black people said, 
you can't write that and still have slavery, that this is an abolition document. And we are the ones who turn our understanding of the Declaration of Independence as being a declaration of independence, which is what it's called, right? We are declaring our independence from Britain to a liberty document that says we are a nation founded on these beliefs of fundamental equality. And you see black people playing this role again and again and again, fighting uh, both in wars abroad and then fighting at home to democratize America. Um, the most cited amendment to the Constitution in case law is the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. This comes out of black organizing uh, and black people pushing at the end of slavery to say, one, we need citizenship. So every person of color watching this who is not uh, indigenous or descendant of American slavery, um, your citizenship came because black Americans pushed for birthright citizenship in the 14th Amendment after the end of slavery. The concept of equal protection, which gay Americans used to go to the Supreme Court and say they had a constitutional right to marry, that women have used, that uh, disability rights activists have used. This comes from the formerly enslaved pushing to codify equal protection in the law for the first time in the history of our country. And then, of course, uh, we don't become a true democracy until 1965, after a decades long black resistance struggle uh, to force us um, to actually uphold the Constitution, which says you cannot abridge the, the fundamental right to vote. So we don't even have a democracy in the United States without black American struggle. We call ourselves the oldest continuing democracy, but you can't be a democracy when an entire region of your country, half of your country has a sometimes majority population that uh, cannot vote and where the vote is violently suppressed. So I think it is just undeniable if you look factually that the primary democratizing force in the United States has been black Americans, the people who value freedom more than anyone because they didn't have it. The people who, because they are on the bottom of society, understand they could never just fight for their own rights because if you are on the bottom, if anyone above you loses their rights, you automatically lose yours. So to get to your question, what does understanding that do? Well, one, it fundamentally shifts how we think about black Americans. Um, if you go on Google and you look up the Negro problem, the black problem, uh, as I say in the democracy essay, you will find unending studies of how to fix what is wrong with black people. Um, if you understand what black people have had to do in this country and the role we have played, then you understand that we have never been the problem, uh, that a society that believed you could enslave people because of their race, um, extract all the profit from their bodies and then force them to live through 100 years of racial apartheid all the way until 1968, a decade before, eight years, not even a full decade before I was born, that that might be the problem. Um, and I think it then gives you, you know, it, it unsettles the narrative of exclusive white power and exclusive white ownership over America and its democracy. And as I also argue, as you know, further down uh, on that same page, is that because we have been told a story where white Americans are the people who create democracy, who enforce democracy, who conceive of democracy um, in this country, who fight for democracy in this country, then we think that white people should disproportionately benefit from democracy in this country, that they are the ones whose vote should never be abridged. They are the ones who policies should be geared around. They are the ones whose uh, public services and public goods uh, should be built to uplift. And if you can unsettle that, I think that we become, we start to see ourselves and become a more fair country. Um, we see that actually, oftentimes, it has been white Americans who have been in opposition to true democracy. And what else it does, and this will be you know, my final point here, is it helps us understand how we have an insurrection on our Capitol on January 6th. It helps us understand how right now uh, we are what's considered by many scholars to be a democracy in decline, where you now have a political party um, that is, some members, prominent members are openly saying, if democracy means we will be ruled by people who are not white, we don't actually believe in democracy at all. Um, so understanding the role that black people have played in opposition to uh, white leadership that said they believed in democracy but didn't practice it helps you understand the country that we're in and really the danger that we're facing. Uh, as I say in that essay, and I say almost every time I give a talk, we have all been taught a story 
a history of a country that never existed. And that rendering of a country that never existed then leads us incapable um, of responding to the urgency of the moment that we're in now, where we have always been a country that has been very uncomfortable with multiracial democracy, that wasn't founded to have multiracial democracy, that only had multiracial democracy for 50 years. Um, and if we understand that, uh, then we can actually uh, fight uh, the erosion of democracy that we're experiencing right now. Every once in a while, when, when you all applaud, I remember that I'm not just on a Zoom. It's kind of amazing. I can't, I can't see you all, but, but that reminds me that you're there and, and makes me sad that I'm not in the same room with you all. So thank you for we, that. We appreciate that you are here in this way, though. So I'm going to ask one last question, and then I'm certain that people want to ask you questions as well. So just to kind of combine my last question, first, I do want to say that the project is so expansive in the beauty of the contributing voices, the essays, the poetry, the works of fiction, and the photography. One that really struck me and has stayed with me is that photo of Elmore and Bertha May falling out of Alabama and their story of their family, yes. um, that whole chapter on inheritance. And so that leads me into my question about how you make the case for how anti-Black racism um, I think justified the centuries of economic exploitation of black people in this country. And you talk about how the solutions to rectify this come in the form of reparations. And people get very upset and touchy anytime the subject of reparations for black people comes up. And so um, my question here then is, you also say that critically those reparations must include individual cash payments to descendants of the enslaved in order to close the wealth gap. Now that, if people, they were already touchy, they <laughs> get extra touchy about that. So can you talk about why reparations should come in that form rather than only arriving in the form of like programs or tax breaks or things of that nature? What, what does this shift and, and how does it help with that wealth gap? Sure. So one, I would just recommend everybody in the audience read the essay. It's quite long. Um, and uh, the entire book builds to the argument of reparations. Uh, the book is not chronological, but there is an order, there is a logic to it. Um, and what I what I what I argue in the justice essay is if you read this book from front to back, there's really only one conclusion you can come to. Um, so I, I would ask the audience to do just Take a moment to do a bit of a gut check, because what I what I know is that polling shows that even amongst white Democrats, the majority of white Democrats, so the you know, the supposed ally of racial justice and black Americans uh, oppose reparations. And um, I believe that part of that is that we really don't understand the history. We don't understand why reparations would be necessary for people who were never themselves born into slavery. Um, and I think it's because we somehow, even though we think slavery was bad, uh, we treat what happened to black Americans as, you know, just on the spectrum of prejudice that every group of people has have experienced. So I really work to both build the case of why reparations is necessary to answer all the arguments about, well, why can't black people just take advantage of this country like everyone else? Uh, you know, why don't black people just get an education or get married or stop having children on a wedlock or save more or start businesses or buy homes? And I use data to discount how um, what we know from the research is there is nothing black people can do individually to overcome the 350 year head start that white Americans have had over black Americans. Um, so why individual cash payments? Let's just be clear. Uh, we like to think of slavery and the 100 years of racial apartheid that we benignly call Jim Crow as a system of racism, right? Um, and we are comforted by thinking of these as racist systems, because if we think of them as racist systems, then we can say once we pass all the civil rights laws in the 1960s, everyone has the same legal rights. Um, legal discrimination has been outlawed. So we have done all that we need to do. What is critical to understand is 
Slavery and Jim Crow were economic institutions. You do not transport 13 million human beings across the Atlantic Ocean because you don't like black people, because you just want to be racist. You do that. We implement the transatlantic slave trade because we uh, wanted to exploit the labor of black people um, to take that wealth out of the labor and bodies of black people and to redistribute that wealth to white people and white institutions. And that's what slavery was. Now, the racism comes to justify this type of barbaric exploitation. Uh, so if we can say, well, they're not really human like we are. They don't feel pain like we are. Uh, they don't love their children like we are. Um, they're not deserving of the same rights as we are because they're not human like we are. So therefore we can buy and sell them like cattle. Uh, that is how you justify this exploitative system and this barbaric crime against humanity. So if you understand that slavery and Jim Crow were economic institutions, then you know that all the civil rights laws of the 1960s never address um, the forced economic poverty and forced wealth poverty of black Americans. All they say is from now going forward, it's not legal to discriminate against you anymore in housing, in schools, in marriage, uh, in every way that you could possibly build wealth. But they don't do anything to repay the 350 years where black Americans exclusively uh, were denied the ability to accumulate any real wealth. So that is why reparations is necessary. Black people have the same legal rights now as anyone else, though we also still experience uh, discrimination in every aspect of American life. I mean, I, I don't know how many of you saw the article that just was in the New York Times a few days ago about a black historian who studies housing discrimination um, and who once he and his wife removed any imagery uh, that showed that they were black in their house, the housing appraisal jumped by $300,000. Well, that is part of what shows just buying a home for black people won't eliminate the racial wealth gap because black people still experience uh, a dual housing market. So if we want to deal with the fact that black people, no matter their education, no matter their income, no matter their marital status, no matter if they own a home or not, um, still have a gaping wealth chasm uh, compared to black Americans because black Americans for the first 350 years were not able legally, uh, socially and politically to accumulate accumulate wealth, then I think the mandate for reparations becomes very clear. Uh, Dr. King said famously, you know, and of course he is, he is uh, the man that we give uh, a great deal of credit for ending legal discrimination in our country with the civil rights laws, uh, 64, 65, and 68. Uh, he says, what good does it do to have the right to eat in a restaurant if you can't afford the hamburger? And the Dr. King that we don't talk about was saying we had to have uh, economic redistribution if we were to finish the work of the civil rights movement, that simply giving legal rights to people who have been unable uh, to take advantage of all the wealth building capacities of this nation, but who actually built the wealth in many ways of white Americans, white institutions, uh, that if we want true equality, you have to deal with that wealth gap that affects people, black people, no matter their income. Um, the last thing I'll say is, the wealth gap is so pernicious that it, it actually widens the more income and education black people have. And a black person with a college degree has less wealth than a white person, uh, typical, a white person who has not graduated from high school. So I do make the argument for reparations. Um, you cannot repair what was done to black Americans. And, and I think the language is critical. Um, Everything that black people experience in this country is not because they are black. Black is a made up category. Black was made up to justify slavery. Uh, what we experience is because we are the descendants of people who were enslaved in this country. And every law that was passed against black people was passed uh, against the descendants of people who were enslaved. So no, we were not enslaved, but we were, we went, we exist in a world uh, where our entire realities um, have been shaped by being descendants of people who were enslaved. And we continue, of course, to suffer the economic ramifications of that. Thank you. Sorry, you asked me to sum up a 10,000 word essay in one, one question, so that's what you get. Thank you so much. I want <laughs> to allow people to ask any questions they have with the few moments that we have left. So you see the microphones up here and at the front if anyone has questions they would like to ask Nicole. And if no one comes up, I can ask her one more. That's fine. I have more questions. <laughs> 
Okay, well, I will go ahead and let's see what's like. Oh, you do have, okay, we do have one, here we go. I'm currently, I'm currently 17 years old. How, what, how should, and I'm currently studying, and next trimester I'm going to be studying American history in my high school. How can I bring it up? How can I bring up this project in a way that won't get me in trouble? <laughs> well, one, let me just say, I'm like super psyched that you're 17 years old and came to this book talk, unless of course your parent dragged you and you didn't have a choice. No, <laughs> no that was, well, it's part of that, but I also did read the book and I did find some very interesting things, so. Okay. Oh, excellent. What, what state are you in? Are you in California? Yes. So, you know, one, um, I do believe in good trouble. I, I was definitely the kid who, once I got a little bit of knowledge in that black studies class, was uh, bringing all kinds of texts that were not assigned into my history courses and, and asking my teacher about them. Um, I, I hope that you are in a school uh, with open-minded educators and that you can introduce the 1619 Project by making it clear it was never the intent that this project would replace the history we already learn, even though the history we learn in school is not very good. Um, it's not saying that you should not teach that and teach this instead. What it's saying is we should be teaching this and other texts and, and really broadening um, and adding to the history that we've been taught that um, there are many narratives of the American story and there are many perspectives through which we can understand our country. And this is one that should be taught in addition to others. So I, I hope you would have the type of educator who understands that um, and who would be willing to expose students to ideas that they haven't been exposed to. Uh, I think that the, the best way you can use the 1619 Project in the classroom is to simply lead students to question, right? Why do you think you've not Sorry. Sorry, your mic went out. Mine? Your, your, your mic back went out, out for a moment. Up. We can hear you. We can hear you now. Uh, I don't know what moment, but um, I, what, I would just, what I was just saying is that the role of an education to me is not to simply confirm the worldview uh, that students already have, but to expose them uh, to new ways of thinking, new um, lanes of knowledge, to get them to question, to get them to be skeptical. And so when you read something in the 1619 Project, it shouldn't be taken as dogma, right? Look at the end notes, go to the sourcing. Uh, educators should use this as a tool to lead students to, to question, to be skeptical, to learn, to determine what is a valid source. Really ask themselves, uh, what else have we been taught um, that isn't necessarily true, who gets to decide what we learn, um, and to take that power for themselves. And hopefully uh, you have the type of educator where uh, they would not think that would be a troublesome thing to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I um, have been looking at the same topic for a lot of years, uh, decades now, and came across a character um, from history, Esteban, from Morocco. And I think it's an incredibly powerful story that helps us understand what really happened at that time. Some, some people who are worthy of history. But how are teachers going to teach such stories if they don't learn about them? So how are we going to devote some uh, energies and resources so that teachers who are very willing to incorporate this actually learn it so they can teach it? So that's a a great and important question. And I, and I talk about this in uh, the preface for the book that uh, it's not even that most teachers are opposed to teaching this history, they haven't been taught it themselves. And you clearly can't teach what you don't know. And um, polling shows that about half of American school teachers feel ill-equipped to teach about slavery um, because they just haven't learned the history well. Now, to answer, like, what do we do about it? This is the beauty of being a journalist. Uh, I just get to expose the problem and you will have to figure out how to fix this shit. So I can't really tell you that. You, <laughs> that's for you all to, to decide. If you want teachers to learn better uh, histories to teach their students, then you have to advocate for those things at your schools of education um, and in um, other types of teacher preparation training. Go ahead. So uh, just, to, just to quickly add, 
um, educators also have to take it up on themselves, right? Like to, to be a great educator, you can never stop learning as well. It's not just about you teaching students what you already know, but you're constantly engaging and expanding and reading. Um, Mr. Dow was teaching things that he was never taught to teach us. What he taught us was things that he was learning on his own and texts that he was learning, uh, reading on his own and bringing them into the classroom. And I would hope that that's what teachers would be willing to do as well. Hi, uh, thank you very much for uh, having this session with us. I'm uh, really sorry that you couldn't join us in person here in sunny San Diego. Uh, just a quick question. When can we expect you out here on the West Coast? We'd love to be able to see you in person. I will be out on the West Coast, but I think it's going to be San Francisco in a couple of weeks. We can drive. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, get your selfie in, all right? <laughs> Someone took a selfie for their mama, so they can show you. <laughs> uh, okay. First off, if, you, if you're from San Diego, you, you see this as the 1619 project. <laughs> just because it's the 619. It's our area code so I don't know if you phone know, numbers. <laughs> but I always wanted to tell you that. Then, <laughs> I uh, didn't know that. That's yeah, awesome. So we like San Diego? <laughs> okay, we need to know. Uh, I'm really interested in reparations, and I see that it's unfolding in California. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had two things that you could recommend towards someone trying to learn about uh, that reparations unfolding, what, what would you suggest them to, to do? Uh, I mean, one, I would look at the law um, and look at the history of the law because there was public testimony, uh, there's transcripts. And so there you get to see all of the arguments being made for why reparations is necessary in California uh, and also the arguments against it, which um, it's just as critical to understanding an issue is not just the arguments being made for it, but the arguments being made against it. When I when I wrote um, the reparations essay in the book, um, I, I architected that entire piece to address all of um, the opposition, the talking points and the opposition that I had seen against it. So to me, the best way to understand the issue is to is to read the, the testimony, the transcripts and, and what the law is seeking to address. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you primary for primary sources. Sorry, and primary not, sources. You know, okay. not what some newspaper reporter like myself decided was important for you to know. But <laughs> um, I'm always, always pushing people to go to the primary sources. First of all, I wanted to thank you for your writing, your speaking, and say just keep teaching. You're doing so much important work. I want to follow up on the reparations topic, and. Um, wondering if you have been working with the that billionaire club giving away half the wealth. We know people like Melinda Gates and Mackenzie Scott have been quite generous. Have you had the opportunity to talk about reparations with those wealthy people who have pledged to give away their wealth? <laughs> Um, no, I have not. I, I haven't been talking Might to any be a nice billionaires. connection. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been talking to any billionaires. Um, and I think what they're doing is great. Um, I think it would be better if they just paid their fair share of taxes and the public could decide what things we want to fund. Um, well, as a, sales, so, as, a, as a professional salesperson, you learn to find out other opportunities to look at how money can be garnered. Yeah, you know, again, um, if you're going to be a billionaire, you should give away your wealth. So I, I totally support that. Um, but it's not democratic, right? It's, it's rich people deciding what public goods they'll fund and what they won't. Um, and frankly, that's not reparations. So I, you know, I, I, I think we can support multiple things at one time. We don't need to be myopic. Reparations to me, and, and there's lots of different ways to have reparations, right? But the reparations that I'm arguing for are coming from the federal government um, and should also be coming from state and local government. But then there's reparations that could be made by private institutions that benefited from slavery and Jim Crow, of course. Uh, so I think we have to have multi-pronged approaches if we want to undo the legacy of slavery, if we want to become an equal and just society. Uh, but I believe in, in, um, in democracy. 
I believe in us getting to decide as a people. And uh, my focus on reparations is not billionaires choosing uh, who and what they want to pay for, but our federal government finally owning up um, uh, accountability. To the, the, right to the to the crimes that were committed. Thank you. And also the, the price for reparations, you know, the, the price tag is in the trillions. Um, billionaires can't can't pay that debt. Hello, Nicole. Um, journalism college professor here. Um, huge fun. Uh, thank you for all the work you do. I, as a UNC alum, I also want to share that many, many of us were really um, frustrated, ashamed in, of what happened to you at UNC. And so in that regard, and as a college professor, I wanted if you can share a reflection on how can we make sure that big money, especially coming from conservative parties, um, don't silence work like yours and don't uh, put at risk academic freedom? Yeah, um, that's such an important question right now because um, clearly academic freedom is under attack. Uh, we're seeing states like Georgia removing tenure, which is one of the, the main protections uh, for academic freedom. We saw what happened uh, with me in North Carolina. Um, and, and so what I would say is, um, to quote Dr. King again, uh, Dr. King said that, you know, those who wish us ill use their time far more efficiently than those who wish us well. And so I don't believe that the legislatures that are passing these types of laws, that um, board of trustees, these political appointees, they're not reflective of the majorities of the states that they represent. And yet they're wielding this power uh, because they're a lot more organized and they're a lot more savvy and cutthroat in how they will power. When you look at the example of what happened at the University of North Carolina, um, the faculty rose up. Right. The faculty became unafraid of speaking out. You had the president of the faculty who was writing open letters. You had faculty joining protests. You had faculty speaking to media so much so that uh, it later came out that the university was looking at their emails to try to find out without them knowing it, who was leaking things to the press. And that protest had an impact because ultimately the board was forced to vote on my tenure. Uh, and grant my tenure, I just rejected it. Um, so I think what what is critical is that when faculty stood up, when they forced the issue, um, they were able to wield power against this, this political minority that was trying to uh, be, be undemocratic, that was trying to violate uh, our right to academic freedom. And that's what we have to do, um, you know, we are in a moment of chaos and the opposition thrives on chaos in that we feel like there's a, a different fire and a different battle um, in a different area every single day. And so I, I've been thinking a lot about what um, histori historian Timothy Snyder, uh, one of the historians who writes about fascism and uh, authoritarianism, he said, we all have to pick an institution and defend it that you can't fight every single battle that is to be fought. You'll be worn too thin and you won't be effective. And so if the most important institution to you right now is the university, um, particularly the public universities, which used to be like the crown jewel of a state and now of course are being so much under attack in many places, um, then you have to organize and defend that because that's the only true power we have is our collective power as citizens in this country. And I don't think we are wielding it uh, as effectively as we should. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for doing this. Um, however, um, I kind of wanted to know your opinion about a few few. I'm things. sorry, I can't, can't hear you. I can't hear there, you. Can there, hold are, that. there are a few things that I want to know your opinion about that the media in America has seen the abuse of black people, but it took a 17 year old a student to um, kind of create this Black Lives Matters. 
And then um, when this became apparent, 20 um, states, which was basically Republicans, they clearly announced that the teachers in the school cannot teach the subject of slavery in a way that the white children would feel disgraced by their forefathers or parents. The other thing is that if the slavery is lifted, it is the same as colonizing other countries. Colonize, they do not colonize, but if some country, they select their government, they sanction them. They lift the slavery, but they put a minimum wage, which is worse than the slavery. Because at least at that time, the owner of mine had to provide me food, housing, health, whatever, so I could work. But now they give minimum wage that is not even um, can provide a minimum life for a person who lives today. Uh, and our media seems is controlled and doesn't see this, doesn't bring it up, whether it's international or within the country. And always we claim that China or Russia's media is controlled, but here no reporters even mentions this in daily afternoon or evening news. That was, I kind of wanted to know your opinion. What, what are these? How are we going to confront this? Because the same way as a 17 year student now asked that he is scared to bring up a question. Look what a country we have, that we say we are free, but a student cannot ask a question about a real history event that has happened because we may get arrested or abused or whatever else that is there. I just wanted to see some, some of your opinion about that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I missed, um, it, was, it was really hard for me to hear most of that question. I wonder if, um, so if what, you could summarize correct for me. me if, I'm, if I'm wrong, yeah, she can hear me better. I think that what he's asking is that within the context of like media here in America, not doing its job of talking about these different um, issues that are going on, for example, the way that people are being paid wages that are not livable. So I think his comparison was like, in slavery, people were not being paid, but the master was responsible for providing like at a minimum shelter, clothing, food. And so now with these like wages that are not even livable, people cannot even afford food, shelter, clothing. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of attention paid to that. There doesn't seem to be a lot of reporting in the media about some of these other issues that go on that are affecting people in these ways. Am I understand? And so he was wanting to know your opinion about as much as we will talk about some of these other governments, like China having controlled media or Russia having controlled media, why are we not seeing American media do more to talk about history, to talk about some of the rights that people should have so that students like the first student who had a question about wanting to talk about this project and its history without getting in trouble, why isn't the media doing more to put that out into the forefront of public discussion and consciousness? And did I get that? Is that what you were wanting to ask? Okay, th there was a lot. There was a lot in that question, um, and I, I appreciate it. So let me just first uh, just say, like my, uh, I, if I was a person who got triggered, which I'm not, the thing that would trigger me is people comparing anything in our society today to slavery. Um, I think part of it is we. We have a paucity of language around uh, exploitation, and so we, we go to slavery, um, saying that you know during slavery people had some clothes and some food. Um, I don't think there's a single poor person in this country who would go back to a time when uh, black women 
could be legally raped because there was no crime of rape against black women where black women were being forced to uh, reproduce slavery through their wounds, through sexual assault, where you had no right to property, where you had no right to your own children, where families were being bought and sold, where people were legally tortured. Uh, it wasn't simply that you were forced to work. It was that you were forced to work through terrorism and violence um, where you could be uh, killed and it wasn't a crime except a crime against the person who owned you who would have to be reimbursed for their property um, uh, loss. Um, so I just think like just just we should never do that. And and the fact that we ever even attempt to make those comparisons shows how poorly we are taught about what the institution of slavery actually was. Uh, people were tortured. These were forced labor camps. Um, and literally had no legal rights that anyone had to represent. They were not even considered human beings. They were considered uh, literal property. So um, let me just get that out of the way. Now, if I remove that reference, um, and, and, and I just, you know, I couldn't be here talking about the legacy of slavery in the 1619 Project and not point out uh, the fallacy of even beginning an argument of comparing anything in modern society to slavery. Um, but with that said, uh, we do have right now one of the most unequal societies in the history of the world. Uh, there are millions of Americans disproportionately black, but majority of them are white uh, who struggle day to day to pay their bills. Um, we know that um, most of the wealth is heavily concentrated in the top 1% of, of our society. And if you read the 1619 Project, then you will know that too is a legacy of slavery. Um, that the reason we have um, the most inequality, uh, the reason why we have the stingiest social safety net of any of the Western democracies we like to compare ourselves to in terms of we're the only one of those countries where whether you can go to the hospital or the doctor uh, depends on if your job gives you insurance, uh, where a woman has a baby and six weeks later has to go to work because we pay no maternal leave in this country. Um, we have no uh, child care subsidy in this country. Um, we um, have the lowest union membership, which means our workers have the least protections and ability to advocate for greater wages. All of these things are because the polling is very clear. White Americans support for social programs decline if they think large numbers of black people will benefit from them. So we have millions of white Americans who vote against their economic interests, but vote in favor of their racial interests, uh, who are willing to also deprive themselves as long as they think they are depriving uh, more black people of the things that every other society we compare ourselves and consider to be the rights of citizenship. Um, that is a, a problem that we will not deal with until we confront the truth about who we are and why we are an exceptional nation in many of the ways that we should be ashamed of. Now, why does the media not cover it? Uh, I don't think you can make a sweeping statement like that. The media is reporting on these things. I would imagine that's how you know about them. But the media is not reporting on them as consistently as it should. Um, I say all the time we make choices. Every newspaper, every uh, TV news has a crime beat, and they will write about every insignificant crime, right? You, you turn on your news and, you know, someone getting their purse snatched will be on the news. And yet we don't have poverty beats. We don't have beats that put that type of attention, that daily attention on how many, how many Americans are struggling every single day to make ends meet. We make those choices, but those choices are being driven by what consumers consume, right? There's a, they say, if it bleeds, it leads for a reason, because you're much more likely to watch that story uh, and share that story about crime and to pass policy about crime because we are, fear drives us to pass policy than you are um, to respond to stories about poverty and need. Uh, so we are all complicit then in the society that we have, because the society we have is the society we choose. If we wanted to take care of our poor, we would. We have enough money to do so. If we wanted a society where people had better wages, we would pass laws to give people better wages. This is the choices that we make. And of course, the media, um, as it beca has become more professionalized, um, doesn't have pe most people who are writing about 
um, our country, it's not that we have state news. It's just most people who are writing about our country have never struggled themselves. They don't come from communities that struggle. They've never experienced struggle themselves. Um, and so they don't write about it in the way that those of us who did come from communities like that would. So there are multiple, multiple reasons why we see the things that we see in the press, um, but also why we as a society accept all of this inequality in a country with vast riches. Um, this is what we know. All of the excuses that we have given ourselves about why we can't invest in social programs, why we let the child tax credit expire and throw millions of children back into poverty, why we don't have universal health care, why we don't have a livable wage. Every excuse we had went out the window in the pandemic when overnight they passed a $3 trillion spending bill and just printed the fucking money. Like they printed it, right? Like every excuse we had that said, we can't do it, we can't afford it. When they wanted to, they did it. And when enough Americans were hurting, like business owners, people who weren't used to hurting, then we could get the will to actually alleviate the pain of our fellow Americans. And now that things have kind of gone back to normal, right? And the normal people who have always suffering are the ones suffering and the people who have had it okay have bounced back. Now we don't really have a desire uh, to spend the money in the ways that we need to. These are choices. Um, so and if you get anything out of the 1619 Project is that I hope is that everything that we see in our society is the result of choices that we have the society we have built, we have created, we have chosen, and we can dismantle that society too. If we choose, we can build a different society if we want to, but ultimately that is going to be on us, not just talking in forums like this, but taking some action. Nicole Hannah Jones. On behalf of the Union Tribune, the University of San Diego, and everyone here today, we thank you so much for making time in your schedule to be here with us and have this conversation. We thank you, everyone, for joining us. And that's been our program for this morning. Thank you again. Thank you so much. <laughs>